All right, Riverwood, how you guys doing? You guys doing all right still? Yeah, yeah you guys look nervous. <laughs> I don't blame you. Um, so uh, the, the, I, before we go, jump into the message, I just want to address last week, I think we had three categorical groups here. Uh, we had a third that absolutely loved it, and I genuinely praise God that was the case for you. I do not want to take that away, and I don't want anyone else to take it away from you. Um, I think there's a third of us that still don't know quite sh or not quite sure what happened, and then there's a third of us that found it to be uh, insensitive, to say the least, and if you're in that latter category, I just want to apologize. I'm asking you for your forgiveness. Um, I think Jeff was just having a bad day, 4,000 sermons later. Um, but uh, yeah, for the first group, again, don't let that take away from you. If you experience something, you grab a hold of that thing and ride that wave out, okay? And uh, we're in the middle of our 30-day prayer challenge, so I shouldn't be surprised that something would happen to try to throw us off, you know? Um, and I just, don't, I just please don't let anything throw us off. We're, we're in the middle of something. Let's just keep praying. Let's just keep committing. Let's keep seeking. And here's the thing. Um, we're officially doing the deeper prayer and worship night on Friday, June 9th. It'll be somewhere between 6 and 9. We haven't had, gotten all the details figured out, but we'll, we'll communicate all that via email, social media, all that. And uh, it'll be a beautiful time to come together at the end of this 30-day challenge. Just see what God does. I promise you it'll be amazing. And as you guys have been doing this prayer challenge, if you guys have heard anything from God, sensed anything from God, had answers prayers, would you guys do us a great favor and just email us and let us know what's happening? Uh, just use the email office at riverwoodonline.org. Again, office at riverwoodonline.org. We really would love to stay in touch with you. All right, with that said, let's pray <laughs> a lot and get into today's message. Uh, Jesus, uh, I don't want to bring my anxiety into this, Lord. We just need your spirit. We just need you to move. We need you to breathe. And God, we just pray that there is nothing that would distract us from the target that you have set our eyes on, and we just continue to believe in you. We continue to put our hope and faith in you and know that you are a God of impossible. So Lord accepts our surrender to you, and may we honor you with everything that we do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Um, this week, <laughs> uh, understandably, was one of the hardest weeks for me to write a message, because all I kept thinking about was watching a train hit a wall. Uh, and uh, it, it was very challenging coming up with this, so I pray to God this has merit for you guys in some way. Um, and I just want to jump into it. This is almost a random story out of Numbers chapter 21. You guys don't got to turn to it or anything like that. And just to give you guys some context, this is basically uh, in the middle of the Israelites' journey to the promised land. And they're caught up in a desert, and they, ha they don't even have the necessary provisions that they need. And specifically, the provision that they needed was water. And they were on this journey to go find this well. And you guys know... Uh, you know, you can live without food for weeks, but you can't live uh, without water for more than three days. And this is one of those scenarios. And if you're in a desert, it's less than three days. I promise I know I was born near one. Um, and here's what's interesting. It says, then Israel sang this song, spring up, oh well. Right in the middle of the desert, when they were discouraged, it looked impossible. All they could see was sand. And instead of complaining, for whatever reason, they began to sing, spring up, oh well. They were making a declaration of faith that was so deeply rooted in what they believed and what their belief systems were. They were saying to the Lord, saying, Lord, thank you that water is coming. Thank you that you're making streams in the desert. Thank you that you're supplying our needs. And it, it was like their way of saying, Lord, we believe in you. We put our faith in you. We put our hope in you. Not what we can see, not what we can touch, not what we can feel, not what we think, just you and you alone, Lord. And again, I've read this verse, I've read this story so many times, and it's amazing how one little word changes the entire story, and that's what this situation was for me, is it says they sang to the well. That, that one word, to. They didn't sing about it, they didn't sing around it, they sang to it. And that was the key. 
I think that is the key still for us, that we have to sing to our promises. Your praise, your thanksgiving is what causes water to flow in the desert. We got to start calling forth those promises he has put in you, in me, in us as a community. If I could say something controversial, not that we need any more controversy by any stretch of the imagination, I'd say this. God responds more to our faith than he does respond to our need. I'll say that again. God responds more to our faith than he does our needs. And I think that that is a beautiful picture that's being painted here. And if you have faith and if you're even struggling with it and wrestling with it but making progress, just know God is making streams in the desert for you. God is making roads in the wasteland. When the odds are against you, I pray that you can just dare to sing, spring up, oh well. I don't know what your dry well is. I don't know if it's your marriage. I don't know if it's your parenting. I don't know if it's your education, your job, your finances, your relationships. I don't know what well it is that is dried up, but I pray that you guys have the audacity to sing to that well, spring up, oh well. I don't think there's any chance um, that I would have responded that way. I mean, there was no reason, logically speaking, for a dry well to be sung to. That makes no sense. It is irrational. And um, if they would have sang a song, if I would have sang a song, it would have probably sounded more like a country western song. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, this well is dry, my dog is dead, my no, no. All right. There's a reason I don't have a music career, people. Don't worry. <laughs> no aspirations. Um, but I really don't think there's a chance if they didn't truly believe in the God of the universe in an immac uh, immaculate way that they would have been able to preach or sing and praise to that well and have it spring up. And so today, uh, what we're talking about is actually the power of belief. Okay, so the focus of this is power of belief. And here's why. Um, I truly believe that belief in God for the impossible is the birth position of revival. I'll say that one more time. Belief in God for the impossible is the birth position of revival. So as we continue to pray, as we continue to take action and commit to the assignments that God gives us, as we continue to even be faithful in the small beginnings, Let's put our faith in God for something so spectacular like a revival or yet another great awakening. And it's okay to be that audacious, to actually believe it will happen. Not hope, not think, but actually believe it's going to happen in us, in our homes, in our church, in our community. Not just somewhere in the world, not somewhere in America, not somewhere in Minnesota. I mean like right here. I, 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 is that selfish? Probably. I don't care. But I, what I want to see is a move of God everywhere that we are. There is nothing that makes one church more worthy than another church. But I believe a church who is hungry enough, thirsty enough, and praying enough will experience anything that we put our hope and trust in God into. And I'm just, I just want to say it for the love of our community, for the love of our families, for the love of our God, we need to believe. And, we, and, and lie till you believe it. Just <laughs> chant it. We believe. I believe. Whatever we have to do. Here's the funny thing. I have dreamt about a revival since 2008, which is the year I gave my life to Christ. And uh, not a clue what a revival was. All I had was this, like, childish way of being like, you know, I, I think I could just see people from everywhere doing this thing and Jesus could, I had no idea what I was talking about, it, but it was just pure, and it was just pouring out of my heart. I wanted to see revival. It took me a year to even learn what a revival was. So fast forward to May 7, 2023. I preached the first sermon in this sermon series, and after the fact, my wife comes up to me and goes, <clears throat> Armin, did you know that there's a group of women here that are like prayer warriors that meet on a weekly basis? And they have been praying for revival in this church for years on end. Not a clue. Had no clue. Had nothing to do with this message. But here's the thing. Is it, is it surprising that there is alignment? Is it surprising that there's unity, whether it's publicly spoken of or kept in the secret places of our private prayers? I think there is something here, I, and, and I don't want to get over spiritual, but I can't stop sensing it. I've had more than 20 opportunities to do interim. I've said no to every single one of them. 
I, would, I, I always said I will never do an inner room roll. But there's something about this place that it's like I have that sense and it's so unbelievable and it's so strong that I just couldn't walk away. I couldn't say no. I couldn't stay the coward that I have been for such a long time. I really do think something is going to happen. And here's a but to go a different direction. Sometimes, sometimes, God puts certain dreams, goals, aspirations, hopes, desires in our hearts that seem so much bigger than us that we automatically dismiss them. Anybody familiar with that little voice that kicks in? It's like, oh, you're about to do something for God, and it starts talking to you, and it's a, that obnoxious little voice that's like, come on, really? You, you're, you're going to do this? You know, don't you think there's someone a little bit better suited for this? Or... Come on, do you really think you have the qualification that's necessary to be going after something like this? Are you sure you're worthy of this? Do you know what I'm saying? You guys, are you guys familiar with that voice? Hey, don't you think you're a little too incompetent to be the one talking about this? Don't you think you're a little too broken to be pursuing the things of God? Are you sure you're smart enough to even go for this? Are you sure you're even strong enough to handle this? Do you, I, I, do you guys need more examples, or are you guys familiar with that? I hate that voice, but it's a very dominant voice in my head, you know? And you know what? Here's the thing. Um, and, and I'll try to say this calmly, but every single one of those things could be 100% true, but still have absolutely nothing to do with whether or not you are called, destined, or otherwise. As a matter of fact, I would say there's possibly a good chance that those aforementioned reasons are the exact reason why God has called you, why God has put that dream on you, why God has put that aspiration in you, in your heart, in our hearts, in the hearts of our community. At the end of the day, if we do accomplish something that audacious, here's the beauty of it. We won't be arrogant enough to be able to walk up to people and say, man, you know, I'm so talented. Good thing I was here, I pulled that off, or I was so wise, I'm so gifted. All that gets taken away, and the only thing that we're left with is just that ability to say, it was truly God. We know it was God. We know it was love. We know it was grace. We know it was Jesus. And that is the most amazing testimony that anyone can get because we don't have the opportunity to stand in front of it with our ego and pride and actually try to pretend like we had something to do with it. That's beautiful. But does the, what does the call of God require? What does a seemingly impossible dream from God require? Here's the final key I would say to this sermon series is belief. And I'll keep hitting that over the head. So what does belief have to do with revival or great awakening? More importantly, how does it align with Riverwood's vision and mission? So there are three important ways that we live out our mission here at Riverwood. We go up, we go deep, and we go out. So we go up together toward the goal of knowing Christ fully. We go deep together in our walk with Christ. And we go out together building relationship bridges in our community and the world that lead people to Christ. Now think about what we've been talking about in the last three parts. Uh, first part was prayer. Is there a better way for us to go up? And then we challenged and did a community thing. Is there a better way to go deep? And then last week, if you could pull this little thread out of there, uh, was action but in love. And what better way to go out? Think about that term that we were talking about, going out, together building relationship bridges in our community and the world that lead people to Christ. Does that sound like a revival at all? Yeah. All right. So, and if I, were, if I were to take what we've talked about so far and just put it in plain language, I would just say, pray something, hear something, do something. That was the last two sermons, okay? And last but not least, even if you haven't heard from God yet, I just, my hope is that we can continue to believe in God for, for the impossible. And that's what we're going to continue to cover today, the power of belief, the power of belief, the power of belief. All right, now if you guys want, uh, you can open up your Bibles. We're going to go to John chapter 6, verse 28 and 29. So John chapter 6, verses 28 and 29. While you guys are doing that, uh, two things. One, the story at the end that I'm going to share uh, may not be the most appropriate for children. Um, 
it has a life and death scenario to it, nothing inappropriate, um, but it, it's adult content, I'll just put it that way. And secondly, um, the, this, the context around John 6, 28, this is right after he feeds the 5,000, which is more likely 25,000, but we don't need to get into that. Um, this is after he did the miracle of walking on water, and he ends up, because he's so overwhelmed by all the crowds, he's on the other side of the sea, and everybody starts to look for Jesus. And eventually they find Jesus, and when they do, they ask Jesus how he got there, and he answers that question, which then leads to verse 28. So verse 28, here's what it says. It says, then they said to him, they being the crowd, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Verse 29, Jesus answered them, and he says, this is the work of God that you believe, that you what? Believe. That you believe in him whom he has sent. Here's the thing about Jewish culture, because that was the predominant audience at the time, which was the uh, audience that Jesus was speaking to. They were used to a long to-do list, a very long list of works. Uh, you guys are all familiar with the Ten Commandments, but here's the thing about Jewish culture. They actually had 613 commandments to live by on a daily basis. I could barely count that high, let alone keep all those commandments. And that's what they were expecting. So when they're coming to Jesus and asking that question, they're expecting a laundry list of intense works that they had to do. And what was his response? He said his, his response was the works of God is to what? believe. That's it. Nothing else. There's no list. Just one word. But it's in who? In the one he has sent, that God has sent. And here's something interesting about this word. It shows up a minimum of 98 times in the book of John alone. Think about that, okay? A minimum of 98 times. And it's always the Greek word pistuio. Maybe you guys want to try that. All right, ready? Say pistuo. There you go. You just said Greek words. Way to go. Uh, it's important to note that this word is always a verb, or it's always a verb, never a noun, okay? So this word has such th this incredible, undeniable focus on the active nature of our belief. So the question becomes, why is there this intense focus on this active nature of belief? Why the need to be so redundant and mention it 98 times in a singular book? Here's my thought. Just my thought, and I want you to come up with your own. Perhaps it's because as people, we almost always put the most, if not all, of our energy and resources into the things that we believe will impact us the most. Okay, you've heard it said, show me your checkbook and I'll show you your priorities. Personally, I don't think our checkbooks actually shows priority. I think it shows us what we believe in most. Uh, and... and why would that be surprising? We're inundated by it every single day. You know how many times a day you guys are advertised to right now? Well over 6,000 times a day. How many of those 6,000 times a day are you actually aware of? You're constantly being fed. You're constantly being told what to believe. And why wouldn't we believe that money will solve our problems? Why wouldn't we believe that money will do even things like take away our depression or increase our joy because we're able to spend more money? And, he, and here's the thing. I, I, don't, I don't want you guys, this message has nothing to do with giving, tithing, money. It's not about that. Don't get distracted. Stay with me. I'm not about to ask you for your money. Uh, but it, it's about belief. And this message is so true for me. Like almost every message I preach is a message I need. I never try, I tried to never preach from a place of superiority or expertise, but only from a place of empathy. And we have been conditioned for these things. So back to those questions of why the need for this intense focus of our active nature of our belief, and why is there a need to mention it 98 times? Here's what I would extend as my answer. Maybe we spend too much time believing in our careers, Maybe it's because we spend too much time believing in our education, in our money, in our power, in our status. But somehow we always end up finding ourselves in the same place, depressed, isolated, lack of contentment, no joy, forcing ourselves to try to have something that doesn't seem to be tangible to us. 
Maybe God loves us so much that he's been trying to show the path to love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control all along. And maybe he knew that he had to be that redundant just to constantly capture his children's attention and saying, no, that's not the way. This is the way. How many of you guys have kids? You guys remember when they were little with outlets? How many times did you have to tell that little kid, don't try to kill yourself by shoving things in the outlet, right? But it's like you have to be redundant. And that's what a father does. And I think all God is doing is just being an unbelievably loving father that's just saying, look, you're going to put your efforts, you're going to put your energy, you're going to put your resources in things that are going to be very manipulative and they're going to try to convince you that these are the things that make you happy and these are the things that will bring you joy and these are the things that will bring you contentment but all along it's taking you down the path that will do the exact opposite and God is saying look this path is still here for you I don't care how much somebody else tries to take it away for you I'll always be here for you all you got to do is believe Man, I struggle because I think about how far off that path I went a couple years ago. How hard I stopped believing because I just got so sick and tired of believing. But God's grace never leaves. God is so relentless in his pursuit of us. He is so unconditional. I don't care how far off the path you are. I can just promise you from experience, not from head knowledge, from personal experience, He's never going to stop being there for you. He is relentless. And he doesn't ask for much other than belief. And until we stop focusing on our shortcomings and qualifications, we'll never be able to see what God has for us, just like I couldn't. To do that, we have to start to believe the God of the universe for the impossible. And the more naysayers you encounter with comments such as, that kid will never make it, or that guy will never clean up his act, or uh, revival will never happen in a small little dinky town like Cannon Falls. All I hear them saying is the exact opposite. Because what God will say is we'll go look at you and say, oh, the world tells you you're not qualified. Let me show them what I do. Oh, God says it can't happen here. Guess where it's going to happen. God doesn't accept the norms of our world. God wants to change it. He wants heaven and earth to collide. And you are part of that. He wants to manifest heaven in your life. He wants to manifest heaven in your marriage, in your parenting, in your work, in everything that you do. He wants the world to see the miraculous hand that he has in your life. And again, without acting or asking for too much other than belief. Here's probably how we would know. I think the list could be longer than this. Here's how we'll know we truly believe God for a revival. We plan for it. We envision it, we build relationships with other churches, we reconcile our differences, we ask for forgiveness so that we can be unified, and we forgive so that we can break off the chains of the past and grab a hold of the glory of God and the future that he has for us. Could that list be longer? Absolutely. I don't want to take that, but I think that's a long enough list and a strong enough list for us to work with. We have to live in such a way that God... if that unless God shows up, what we're attempting to do is bound to fail. This is the nature of the gospel. Go after the impossible, because if we can do it on our own might, with our own wisdom, with our own strength, did we really do something that was a move of God? But if we go after the impossible, and it's something that literally requires God for it to happen, that in my mind is a move of God, and I can't wait to see it happen here. And sure, Unbelief is safe because it takes no risk and it almost always gets what it expects, which is nothing. Status quo, more of the same. And faith isn't the absence of doubt, it's actually the presence of belief. Great faith doesn't come out of great effort, but out of great surrender. And that's all that our prayer life has been so far. It's just been this complete, utter surrender to God and saying, Lord, have your way with us. Have your way with Riverwood. Have your way with Cannon Falls. Have your way with our family. 
We don't believe because we understand. We understand because we believe. The Bible makes things really backwards sometimes, and that's okay, and that's okay. But this is where we have to get introspective and genuinely start asking ourselves, what do I really believe? What do I really believe about myself? What do I really believe about God? What do I really believe about church? What do I really believe about humanity? And here's the thing. A lot of you probably have really good answers to share with other people, but I don't want you to share those answers with other people. This is between you and God. And be as honest and brutally as honest as you can be. And here's the thing. You may not like your answers. You may not like what you believe about yourself. You may not like what you believe about humanity. You may not like what you believe about God or church. And that's okay. It is a beautiful place to be, to have that realization and the reality of your belief system so that you can wrestle with it and stranglehold that thing until it aligns with God. Not all of faith is meant to be kumbayas and merry-go-lucky everything and everything is always happy. There is a fight in the journey of spirituality. There is two forces. There isn't just all good, no bad. The struggle is real and that's okay, but the fact that you're willing to struggle with it and wrestle with it is what will bring you to new heights in your spirituality, to new levels of maturity, to new levels of experiences with God. So here's the thing, I wanna end on this story. Um, we're gonna play a video and uh, it's, it's, it's my wife's testimony. This video is about 10 years old now, actually. Um, and this, hopefully I can get back on stage and still be able to talk, but um, I know you can hear a message like this and somebody might think, oh, here, here's another <laughs> um, disconnected, discombobulated pastor talking about belief like it's an on-off switch. I promise you I know it's not an on-off switch. I promise you I know it's a journey and sometimes it can be a grueling journey. And sometimes you can completely turn it off and walk away. But the reason I'm sharing this story is just to show you, even if you have walked away or even if you've never believed in God, here's what the power of belief can do in someone's life. So tech team, if you guys are able to, let's play this video. Growing up, I was extremely blessed. We had everything I could have ever wanted. An amazing home, great family. We went to church every Sunday. I had a picture-perfect childhood. It was during my junior year of high school where my entire world fell apart. My parents ended up going through a divorce. Everything just changed overnight. We went from having everything to having nothing. And I remember there being days where we didn't know what we were gonna eat. My mom, my brother, and I ended up walking into church, the church that we had grown up in. There were people in the church that had completely turned their back on, on us just because um, we were a broken family. I remember leaving church that day this is what God is all about, if this is what his love is all about, I want nothing to do with this. My mom ended up getting remarried. I, I just thought, this is it. Our lives are going to start turning around and getting better. After a while, I ended up finding out that um, the guy that my mom remarried wanted, wanted nothing to do with my brother and I, and we were on our own. And I just felt sense of rejection again. That's when I kind of started my own personal downward spiral. I ended up moving down to the cities to go to school at the Abeda Institute, and I moved down to the cities with my best girlfriend at the time.
was on my best friend's 21st birthday. She ended up deciding to go home. I had gotten a call really late at night from her sister. Hello? Ashley, is this Ashley? Something has happened. I'm sorry, are you sitting? Slow down. She's gone. I don't, I don't understand. Ashley, she is gone. I have to go. It was that night that I just have hit rock bottom and there is no other way out. God, God, if you are real, I can't do this anymore. And I woke up the next day and I just felt something different. Miracle after miracle started taking place. You wouldn't believe how things have changed. I was at work and this kid came in. I've never met him. He said God told him that I should go back to church. He said he felt that someone might call me. So strange, but it got stranger because the phone call came. It was my cousin inviting me to church. I did, I went back. And during worship, the pastor came on stage and said, I feel like there's a girl here tonight that just experienced the loss of someone really close to her. And I want you to know that God loves you and he heard your prayer. I didn't know what I was praying the night that you left, but God answered. It, it feels like a miracle. actually gave her life back to Jesus. Um, that was the night that she started believing again. It was a deeper worship night like the one that we're about to have on June 9th. Doesn't feel like a church service, but I promise you, you don't need a church service to witness God, experience God, or hear from God. And here's what I can say, is if it wasn't for my wife's belief system, when I lost my mind, she was our rock. She never stopped believing. She never stopped praying. She never stopped believing in the call of God in my life. She never stopped believing that our family was meant to be. And I don't know where you're at in your life. I don't know where you're at in your faith journey. I don't know if you walked away. I don't know if you have never engaged with God, but I just want you to know 
He's chasing you. He's pursuing you. He wants you. And he's never going to stop loving you. And let's, I, I don't know, I wasn't even planning on doing this. Um, would you guys do me a favor? Can you guys just all close your eyes just for an intimate moment here? Um, and please give people their privacy by closing your eyes. Uh, is there anyone here, and don't feel obligated, I'm just curious, is there anyone here feels like they walked away from God or feels like they have never actually engaged with God? Would you be willing to raise your hands just for me to see? Okay, you guys can put your hand down. All right, and keep your eyes closed again. Please just respect people's privacy. This is not about us seeing anything. This is about someone in their relationship with God. Uh, I, again, I'm just curious. Do you feel like you're ready to take that leap of faith and engage God today? If you are, would you be willing to raise your hand? This is just for me to see. See these guys over there on the left. See you in the back. See you over there too. All right, you guys can open your eyes. Thank you for the privacy. I really appreciate that. Could we do a community prayer quick, would you, like a repeat after me prayer, if, if that's not too cheesy? And would you guys all do it with me? Um, I just, there, there's some people ready uh, right now to engage that relationship with God, and I would just love to join them in this so that it doesn't feel awkward for anyone. So could you guys do a repeat after me prayer? All right. Jesus. We come before you, surrendering our life, putting our hope and faith in you. We put our belief in who you are. We ask you for your forgiveness. And we pray that you accept our surrender to be yours today and forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, if you guys don't have to make it obvious I'm talking to you if you rose your hand. Uh, it, it, if you rose your hand, I, I would love nothing more than to walk this journey with you. Not just me, but any staff you saw, any elders that you saw, I can't tell you or articulate enough that there is very few honors that are greater than that. And we would love nothing more than to walk side by side with you on this journey. Here's what I can promise you, it does not make life easier. I know there's a lot of people standing in the pulpit that'll tell you just follow Jesus and everything gets easier. I don't think that's true, but I can promise you life will get better. But God will make you face your darkness not because he wants to scare you, but he wants to show you that light will conquer darkness every time. And that light is in you. So if any of you raised your hand, please find an elder, find a staff member, find me, and let's walk through this. I'm not gonna let go of you. I don't think the staff is gonna let go of you. Elders are not gonna let go of you, and we will walk this out, okay? All right, we're gonna go into this one last song of worship, I believe. Um, and I just, I just want to, sorry, I pray way too much, I know, but it's the only thing I got that makes me capable of doing anything for Jesus. Um, I know it's a solemn moment, but I live for this. <laughs> I'm an evangelist at heart, and um, it took someone evangelizing me to uh, keep me alive, keep me out of prison, and... Uh, I, you have no idea how much this moment means to me that you guys are willing to be as audacious as you were today. So I'm just going to pray over them and we can just go into it. Lord, I thank you for these bold, audacious people. I thank you that they have decided to make a change in their life. I thank you for the fact that they're willing to put their belief in you. And I thank you that they're finally in a position to put out the darkness in their life. 
and bring in the light that comes from you. And I pray, God, that there's miraculous moves on their hearts. I pray that there's miraculous moves in their marriages, in their jobs, in their finances. God, I pray that there is breakthrough after breakthrough. And God, whatever is holding them from their past that is making them think that this is not what they're worthy of, God, I break those chains in the name of Jesus. And I just pray, God, new life, new hope, new breath. I pray that there's new joy, new contentment. I pray that this community surrounds them and they feel like they just joined a gang or a tribe. I, feel, I pray that they feel the protection that comes from you and community. I break off isolation. I break off depression. I break off anxiety. And God, I pray that you manifest your love in their lives in ways that will make it impossible for them to not shout your name from the rooftops. So Lord, we give this to you. We give them to you. We give ourselves to you. And God, I just pray, would you use us to make your name more famous than it's ever been? In the name of Jesus, we pray. All God's people said.